Hello, Reed. Thank you so much for joining me here on Illuminate Magazine. Oh, thank you for having me. It's, it's an honor to be here. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy that you're here. And now we can actually talk about the project that we worked on together, Mosquito right. Coast, which is an Very Apple TV exciting. original starring Justin Thoreau. We can't really give much away about our characters, sure. but tell us a little bit about what you can say and your experience filming in Mexico. We can't say anything. Uh, we can't give any uh, plot lines away, but he's within the pantheon of my horrible white men characters. <laughs> Douchey CEO is on my, my Rolodex of parts that I play. Shooting in Mexico was amazing. I mean, we met the day we, we were shooting at a luxury resort you know, oh, right yeah. by the pool. It was so funny because it was one of those jobs, as they all come, you never see it coming. And then my agent calls and they go, oh, they want you to come do the Mosquito Coast. I'm like, great. She goes, and they're shooting in Mexico City. And I go, fantastic, Mexico City. I'm so excited about this because I'm a history nut. There's the famous museum there of archaeology in Mexico City. And I'd always heard that the restaurants were spectacular and it was one of the great cities of the world. So I'm all prepared. I'm excited. I'm doing research on Mexico City. And like two days before we have to go down there, the travel coordinator calls and says, um, okay, I just want to book your flight to Tulum. I'm like, Tulum? And I'm here in Toronto and it's winter, it's March. And I go, oh, I better go to storage and get my summer clothes. So I knew two days before that we were going to be on the Caribbean, on the on the Yucatan Peninsula, which was equally exciting because oh, there's yeah. so much, I mean, my God, so much history there. And I already visited some Mayan ruins in Honduras, I mean, a long time ago. And so I was very excited, but I had to switch my field of research from the Aztecs. I went over to the Mayans and it was crazy. It's a quick flight down there from Toronto and they put us in these beautiful sort of boutique hotels. Yeah. It was amazing. And then it was shooting in Mexico. So, I mean, in the old days, my first movie, I got really spoiled. My first movie ever was a movie called Memphis Bell. I made it in 1989. And we shot it in London in, on location in England. So the first movie, I'm 21 years old. I spend four months in England. I go to boot camp in the south of England. And then we start shooting for a while on an Air Force base in the north of England. And then we come down to London shooting at my favorite studios of all time, Pinewood Studios. The studio. Oh, I've heard they're amazing. Oh, well, because it's, it's like growing up, uh, all my favorite movies, especially the James Bond movies, were all shot at Pinewood. So for me, Pinewood was iconic, right? More so than, yeah, yeah. obviously we've all shot at Warner Brothers, we've shot at Paramount, we've shot on the Fox lot. And those are cool, but for me, Pinewood, because there's so much history of cinema there. So we're shooting at Pinewood, my favorite studios, which is just a trip unto itself, but it really spoiled me because I thought, oh, I'm gonna have all these exotic locations. And back then they would pay to fly Americans to London, the whole cast, we were all American. They flew us all over there, 10 of us, and there for four months and lived like kings. But then as the years went on, locations often became less and less romantic. And we all shoot in Vancouver all the time or Toronto where I am right now because there's tax breaks or suddenly we were shooting in Atlanta all the time or right. or recently, I pretty much, I felt like I, I only worked in New Orleans. New Orleans does a ton of stuff and New Orleans is a cool location, but what's interesting is I think only one time I've shot in New Orleans for New Orleans to be New Orleans. I've, every other time, New Orleans is a stand-in for Los Angeles or some other. And the thing is, if, have you been to New Orleans? I haven't. Okay. So there's one thing that's distinct about New Orleans is New Orleans looks like New Orleans. It doesn't look like anywhere else. It is a singular place. So if you're shooting New Orleans to be New Orleans, you're in the right place. But if you're shooting it to be Los Angeles, which is funny because I play all these evil uh, white guys, I literally on three different shows had the same mansion as my mansion because it was the only oh mansion, my gosh. which is hilarious, right? Because the first time I was supposed to be in Beverly Hills and it was the only house that wasn't all that beautiful colonial New Orleans architecture with the wrought iron and all that. This could pass as Beverly Hills. Three shows in a row went down there and it was my house. I felt right at home. I knew where everything was. So, but Mexico was so exciting. And, and what I think also made it really fun were a couple of things. COVID's really changed filmmaking because in, oh, yeah. it's going back to more of how it was in the old days. Because in the old days, they would just bring you out for pretty much the whole time. And so the cast and the crew, you all have this, this real great opportunity to bond and spend time together. And that's one of the best aspects of it is, you know, one of my favorite parts about being an actor is that you meet really cool, interesting people. Now with COVID, because you have to be there a few days before, you have to get tested, suddenly you had time to acclimate and also hang right. out with people. And then with this show, what was so great is we're all in the same hotel. You, know, you could walk from on the beach from hotel to hotel. So they're all right next to each other. And then also we shot French hours. We shot these those 10-hour days. So it was great every night. 
we all got finished at a reasonable hour so you could get together for dinner and have a social life. And for me, that was my favorite. One of the best parts about this Mosquito Coast that we did together was just like everyone was cool and then we'd get to hang out. And I really love that. Yeah, Mexico was so exotic and beautiful location. I made sure I went snorkeling or paddle boarding or kayaking every day. I made sure I got into the ocean every day. And I went snorkeling right outside the lighthouse in Tulum or the village in Tulum. And there were tons of sea turtles swimming all around us. And uh, it was super, it's a remarkable place and uh, amazing location. And then everyone was lovely. And then the crew were just They were amazing. Amazing. It was amazing. You know, I think people often forget like how lucky we are to get to do this. And when people complain about this job, I mean, again, we're playing pretend for a living and we're, we're making TV shows and movies. We're so lucky to do it. And down there, you could feel that everyone, even the down to the background, right? Everyone was super excited to be there. And, and that's such a lovely environment to be in. Old world charm. Yeah. You live in Toronto. Is it difficult for you to have to travel for all those roles? And is it difficult not being in a place like LA or New York? Because I know Toronto does have a big hub itself. I moved up here prior to the pandemic, but I've been living in California since 1992. And I've been in LA for a long, long time. And then I got into a place in my career where auditioning wasn't sort of a a regular thing. And I was on a show. So we moved up to Los Olivos. We moved up to the wine country about two hours north of LA because that was a, a dream place. And, and it was perfect because my daughter was about to go to sort of the next iteration of school. And we're like, well, let's go now. And we went up there. And so she went to school at the base of a national forest there. And it was just, nice. we had this, you know, we had a five acre ranch and it was just an amazing, amazing time and a great place to raise a kid and just be, I, I was hiking and then I'd drop her off at school and then go hike in the national forest every day. So that was spectacular. And it worked because the business had now gone, wasn't centralized in Los Angeles. So I was luckily on a show in LA at the time, but everything else I was doing was somewhere else. I was either going to Vancouver or I was going to New Orleans or Atlanta. So I thought it didn't really matter where I lived anymore because you were going to get on a plane to go there. And so living about two and a half hours outside of LA worked, that worked great for years. The second my family moved here to Toronto, my wife wanted to go back to work. We wanted to give our kid a little city life. I'd grown up in New York, but my wife had grown up here and she's a dual citizen. And my daughter was a dual citizen. We thought, oh, let's give Toronto a try. And and I thought, great. But they went out ahead of me because I was, of course, I I got a show in California. So now they're here in Toronto. And I'd been on a show for two years up here when the last long term show I was on while we were living in Los Olivos. Then, of course, since we moved here, I only worked in California. Since we've been here, I'm on a show here now. And it's the first time in three years since we've been here that I've worked even in, in, for, you know, Toronto or Canada. I've only worked on shows in L.A., um, <laughs> Literally only worked on shows in LA. And of course, this would have been so convenient when I lived in California, but it's always how it's going to go. I think to answer your question, the business has changed, right? I mean, sometimes they want you to be local and you can be local, but it's also self-tapes aren't going away, right? Right. It seems like that's now the main focus. And at first, like, of course, when it happens, it's like, oh, we're having to do tapes. We're not going to go in person. We're not going to you know, get to show our personality in the same way connect with casting director, it gives us more freedom in some ways. Everything that I've booked in the last two years has been from self-tape. I think that it's going to stay and I think that it's actually been really helpful for us. Yeah, I enjoy it because my wife's an amazing actor. Now she's going back in the business and she had retired when our kid was born. Now she's, she's on five shows right now. I call her the Meryl Streep of Canada. She's the more talented member of the Diamond household. But it was great because we can do each other's self-tapes and then they're fun because it's like we can improvise with each other. Because I know it can be hard, you know, some actors, you know, if you're married to an accountant or lawyer or someone who's just not, it can be challenging. But my daughter's also really good. Like we were on the road. I got Better Call Saul because they were like, yeah, you got to put yourself on tape. And she and I were in some hotel room in Springfield, Missouri. And uh, he shot it in the corner of the hotel room and then I got it a couple days later. But she's quite good. She gives me pretty intense notes, though. She's highly critical of me. (laughs) You're um, like, I know if I tape with her, she's going to give me some notes. But, you know, when you're doing your audition, especially your self-tape, you're like, I need to be amazing from A to Z, right? <laughs> you have to have a little discipline about it. I even allow myself to do more than three takes. If you haven't found it then, if you haven't had the fun and played. I mean, I think that's probably why they do the Zoom. So I think is they want to make sure that you didn't do 97 takes. Exactly. And it's so funny how often in auditions, you do it one way. You book it, and then on set, it's completely different. Of course. They sometimes direct you to be completely different. Mm -hmm. But I guess 
because they know that we have the range and that we made the strong choices so they can pull us back or push us to go further if they want. Sure. I think that in some ways it's ultimately just up to do they think that we will try to make those bold choices and will we connect with the character? Will we connect with the scene? And can they just redirect us to do whatever they're envisioning? Right. It's interesting because art is so subjective. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was doing some digging into your film history because you've mm. been in so many projects. Better Call Saul. Gaslit, which I'm also in. Yeah, that's um, right. Bosch, uh, Dollhouse. So many projects. One of them that you were in for 69 episodes was Homicide Life on the Street. Yeah. You were in that from 95 to 98. And your character had so many roller coasters of a storyline. Sure. There was corruption, almost being killed numerous times, dealing with a drug right. kingpin. That's so much for a character to go through. Was there ever any plot line that you had in that show that you found that was almost too challenging, but then ended up being really rewarding. What was special about that character, like that was probably Mike Kellerman who I played on Homicide. He's, I probably would say he's the favorite character I've ever played, right? It was a dream come true. I wanted to be on that show. I remember watching the pilot. I was shooting a pilot in Vancouver and the, their first episode aired. And I go, I want to be on that show. Cause there was a period of time, I was obsessed with cops at the time, it was 1993. And I almost contemplated quitting acting and becoming a cop in LA for a little while, just because I was having some sort of existential crisis. But then I, all my cop friends all wanted to be actors. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm really an actor. So when they brought me on the show, I had been basically preparing to play that character for like two, three years. And I don't think they knew that. I think originally they, they would bring me on to do a little beefcake on the show, but it, it didn't end up being that way. So right away, the writers realized, oh, we can take him in these other um, areas. You know, there's an adage, right, that on television, the character is the actor, right, on some level, because you're playing him so much. I had such a kinship with him and I felt he is who I would be had I grown up in his circumstances. So I didn't find anything challenging, but I just remember being so delighted. I felt like they gave me so many gifts. I remember just sitting in the office because the scripts would come out once a week, right? Right as you were starting one episode, the next episode script would come out. It was so organized, nothing like how things are today. And I would sit there in the office and read it because you had a little mailbox in, in the production office where your script would be. And I would just read them. I'm like, oh my God, I remember calling... David Simon, uh, who written the book that the show was based on and then created The Wire. He was a writer on the show. And he wrote this, I go, where, where I killed Luther Mahoney. And I was like, this is amazing. I can't believe you're putting me in these circumstances. And, I, and that was a joy. And that was also one of those, a great place to pretend because we had no sets. It was all real. Even where the squad room was, it wasn't flats. It was a building. Uh, hilariously, it's now a luxury hotel. And... <laughs> <laughs> I went back, I, I stayed there two years ago with my wife and my kid. And literally I, where, where we're having lunch, I was like, oh, this is where the restaurant is. I go, this is where my trailer was. And then we walk into this sort of banquet room where someone's doing their wedding photos. And I go, this is the squad room. My desk was right here. And it was so cool to be back on the pier. It was a functioning building and everything was practical. So if you saw us going up the stairs, we were going up the stairs and going in there and coming out. It was a real building and then everything else was shot on location. But Baltimore is a character in that show. So it was really an amazing experience. I cried my, when I was knowing when I was doing my last episode because the character was sort of in, written into a corner because of, I killed this guy. Right. Um, and it was, you know, questionable circumstances. Uh, and so what ended up happening is there was really nowhere for Mike Kellerman to go anymore. He couldn't really, he was sort of at his desk and stuff. And I remember Tom called me. He's like, what do you want to do? I go, I think we should end it. I think this should be my last season. And he's like, okay, great. But can I not kill you? And I was like, yeah, you don't, I was like, great. Yeah, you don't have to kill me. So I remember when my first, you know, when it, when it ended, I remember just sitting in my car and, just, you know, I was crying, you know, I was thinking I had handed back in my badge and my gun, you know, he'd been a real part of me. So uh, that was, I mean, what was challenging about it in the beginning for me was it was really my television boot camp because I'd started in the theater and I, I felt much more comfortable still on stage at that point than I did in front of a camera. I was still scared of the camera. And then when I got on Homicide, that was my crash course in television acting. And it was, what was really exciting about that too, was it was all handheld. So you never knew when you were going to be on camera, which made the scenes much more exciting. So no one could check out and just the DP would just swing around and grab you. So that was a really, 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 really special experience. You certainly get 
challenging material. The ones that you really love are the ones where you go, oh, I hope I'm good enough. I hope I'm good enough because this material is spectacular. And it's fun. You know, I've been really lucky and I love what I do. And in the last four or five years, I've fallen madly in love with it again in the same way, like the same passion that I had as a teenager starting out. And there's no better feeling than like the excitement the night before. You're like, oh, I can't wait to go to work the next day and play this scene. There's nothing better than that feeling. And, you know, the, the delightful butterflies and you're just going like, but I, I can't wait to do this. This is going to be really fun and it's exciting. So, like I say, we're really lucky to get to do what we do. And, and, we are. and I, never, I never forget that, you know, and it's just amazing. Exactly. Um, and sets are such a magical environment. You get to work with other people your work will be on right. TV or in a movie. Absolutely. We get to entertain people. And it's hard, right? You know, sometimes it's hard. You know, there's emotional things that you, your places you don't want to go that you're going to have to go to do it. But that's, you know, it keeps you young because it's never the same day, right? And it's a thousand first days of school, right? That's how I always think of it because you, you're meeting new people. And like you said so eloquently, you know, we've, you've got to create a relationship in two seconds. We've just met, rolling. And, you know, that's what you do. And you're like, okay. And yeah, um, we're basically like family. That's our characters. It's right. what's funny is as soon as we wrapped Mosquito Cabos, got home and was watching TV and it was like, oh, that's Reed. I just worked with him. I saw you in like four different shows. Right. And one of my favorites that I watched was Wayward Pines. Oh, and wow. Was, yeah. And I had no idea you were in it until I was watching it. And right. I was like, oh, my gosh, I just worked with him. Tell me a little bit about working on that one. That was an interesting one because I remember so we shot, once again, I'm living in Los Olivos. I'm living in California. We shot that up in Vancouver, of course. I was going up in Vancouver. But it was one of those where I read the pilot. I had to audition for that one. And I read the pilot. And I'm sitting in my room and the pilot was so compelling. And I was like, oh, well, I'll find out what happens if when I get the part. And I'm like, well, what if I don't get the part? So I immediately downloaded the book that it was based on that Blake Crouch wrote. And in one sitting, I didn't get up from my chair in my office and I just read the whole book. And it was so good. And I was like, oh, I want to tell this story. I want to make this show. It was an interesting experience because we didn't make the book. We changed a lot of things, but it was it was a strange experience. There were a lot of big personalities and it was one of those shows where a lot of the big personalities would come in with their versions of the scene and rewrite the scene and not necessarily <laughs> for the better. So it was a little crazy. I remember one night where an actor was supposed to deliver like a three-page monologue to like a hundred extras. The set, it wasn't a set. We, we took it over a town. A I town think I know what scene you're talking about. Yeah. And then he came out and he decided to sing a song instead. And I'm like, this is cool. Because I'm always like, let's make it weird. Like, I have no problem with like, let's make it weird. There's a reason I think that at the end of that show, they killed off the entire cast. But... I'll give you a really happy Hollywood story about someone writing scenes. I had a great scene in this movie, Moneyball, with Brad Pitt. And Bennett Miller directed it. And we shot the scene on the first day of shooting on Moneyball. And so that was on a Monday. So on the Friday, we come in for a rehearsal. And I'm like, rehearsal? I'm so used to TV. I'm like, let's shoot it. But we come in for rehearsal. And I think the script had been written by Sorkin, Aaron Sorkin. But Brad comes in with his version of the scene. And I'm like, oh, God. Lead actor's coming in with his version of the scene. Screwed up what an awesome duty is. He gave me so much more to do. He'd written tons of lines for me, you know? So I was like, Brad, there's no way not to be, I'm so in love with Brad Pitt. But I was like, that's, it's, of course, he right. gives me more to do. And then when we shot the scene, we ended up improvising almost the whole thing. And we, and every once in a while we'd hit lines from somebody's version of the script. And that was a crazy one too, because I remember we'd shot Brad's coverage first. So we're shooting that way in that direction. And there's all these background guys behind him. We're, we're in my office. I'm the, I'm the manager of the Cleveland Indians, general manager, whatever. And, and we just improvise and we shot it on film. So Bennett Miller would sit under the camera and we would improvise. We would just keep going, repeating until the mags ran out, until the film ran out, they reload and we just keep going again. So for six hours, you know, before lunch, we did Brad's side. And then we go to lunch. I've been improvising for six hours and all the background guys are like, oh man, you're killing it. So good. I go, I'm, I'm not killing it. It hasn't happened yet. Like <laughs> none of that's on film. Like, and I'm like, like, I'm like, I don't know if I can improvise for another six hours when we come back from lunch. But then luckily we came back and we got it all in two hours. Bennett would just call out because we'd gone on all these crazy threads of improvs. Like one where I did a whole Captain Kirk thing and like he, he'd just call out, he'd call out Captain Kirk. We just, we do the Captain Kirk version and he'd call out like, you know, the Salusta Trek, whatever the other one was, we'd do it. It was an incredible experience. So sometimes people can come in with their own version of the scene and it's better. Uh, you never know. Kiefer, when I worked with Kiefer on 24, he'd always rewrite the scenes and they were always better. 
he didn't necessarily give me more to do, but they were definitely better. <laughs> it's, it's cool that you can say, you know, Brad Pitt and Kiefer Sutherland, you know, rewrote some of your scenes, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah I it's fun. Yeah. It's fun getting to hear that behind the scenes process sure. and getting to yeah. hear those things. I read that you went to Juilliard and that you sure. did a lot on Broadway. But another really interesting thing about you is you have your own band, which I had no clue about. So. Right. Wait, tell me how that got started. Well, that's so funny. This is this is a good story. So I love music. I remember about eighth grade, I was I was really into playing music, and I had bands in high school. But really, about tenth grade, I made a decision. I was like, music or acting, and I was like, acting. You know, that was really where I wasn't. I was I loved playing music, but I wasn't particularly good. And then I went down the acting road. And then somewhere, I guess I was thirty nine, right? So I'm in L.A. and I just started playing with a buddy. And then we started doing covers. We were sort of like post-punk band and we'd play. And then one day my wife came to rehearsal and she sang a song. She's, she's an amazing voice. She's an incredible singer. And, and it's like, you should be the singer in the band. She's like, yeah, but I don't like your songs. They're, they're, they're stupid. And so then she and I started writing together. She'd write all the lyrics. I'd write all the music. And we had the band. And we, we were playing for a while. We played until she had our daughter, Ailish, our kid. So we had the band for about, I don't know, three years. We played. It was great. It was so much fun. Because acting is my day job. And music is still, there's something I just love so much about it. I play all the time. It was great writing our own songs. We recorded, then I built a home studio and we were recording there. But now the best part is I've got a new band with my kid. So my kid just oh, turned yeah. 14, right? And so one, I guess I was only like six weeks ago and I was off. There's a great little music shop here down the street. I was going to buy a new amp, a guitar amp. And I was like, hey, do you want to come with me? She's like, yeah, I'd love to come with you. And uh, and I was walking home and she helped me pick out a better amp because I was looking at one amp and then the guy's like, oh, listen to this one. And she's like, that's a much better amp. She's right. It was a much better amp. She's got immaculate taste. And as we were walking home, she goes, you know, I really like to play the bass. And I was like, oh, my God, I've got a bass upstairs. I was like, let's go home. Let's go play. And she was natural. Right away, we're playing Joy Division songs. And she's playing. So <clears throat> we have our so my new band. So the, our old band was Chuck Valiant. Right now, we we're sort of a punk band. We're named it after my dog's breath. I'm like, it's a mixture of piss and fish. So we're piss fish right now. <laughs> That's our band. I think we'll change it because we went to two punk shows. We drove to Detroit to see this Australian band that we love, Amel and the Sniffers. And that was cool. Like her first, like, you know, grown up gig. So we're on the floor, mosh pit, real, real punk band. They were great. And then we went to see another band here and they were, real, they were hardcore punk. She turns to me and she's like, I think we're a little more post-punk, like Echo and the Bunnymen. And I'm like, we are definitely. We're more melodic. So piss fish, we may have to change the name. But yeah, I love music. I wish, you know. I love that you are so involved with your family in both acting and music that you guys really get to just create together. Yeah, we're lucky. We're really lucky. I mean, it's funny. I'm on a show here and my wife, of course, I told you she's on five shows. She's on my show too. So now it's the first time we've been on the same show together since the movie we met on 21 years ago. We haven't acted together, but we do act together on all of our self tapes. Yeah, it's great. You know, we're we're really tight. I mean, family, family first. You know, I love my yeah. career, but I do it all. And so I can be with my family and, and pay for things. So it's great. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun to be creative together. And it's great to have the music together. And Marnie is going to come be in our band too. She's come for a couple of rehearsals. She throws in some acoustic guitar and lays down some vocals. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I can't wait to hear something from you. Yeah, yeah. Now my daughter, we're starting to write. So she's like, yeah, we got to do our own stuff. And we'd already been jamming. So we come up with, this is how songs are created. Like you just start playing this and I play something over it. And then we'll put some words on it. She's had her birthday. She got a bunch of guitar or bass gear. I'm a lucky guy. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Well, before we wrap things up, yeah. are there any upcoming projects besides Mosquito Coast that we want everyone to go check out that you have coming up soon? For sure. So the Mosquito Coast, and then I've got something very exciting coming out. I'm, I'm super psyched about that show. So that's Congrats. yeah, thank you. Oh my god, this has been so much fun. You're so wonderful to chat to. I do these a lot, and you're just a delight. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure for me and an honor. Thank you thank you. I actually really loved working with you. And I'm so happy that we got to connect and talk yeah. a little bit more. Now, where can people find you on social media? I'm the Reed Diamond on Instagram because Reed Diamond was taken. I know. The Reed Diamond. Instagram is my favorite place. And then I'm, I'm Reed Diamond on Twitter. I go in there and just try to put funny stuff up there. But you got to be so careful. Like, no politics. So Instagram, I like it much more because you just put your little silly pictures up there. 
Exactly. Uh, you you yeah. put on your picture. That's it. You know, yeah. you don't have to really worry the same way. But as my daughter talked, we were at the amusement park for the Halloween stuff, uh, Canada's Wonderland this weekend. And she's like, you're terrible at taking selfies. I'm like, I just don't do it that much. She's like, she's like, you, you don't know how to hold the camera. I'm like, I don't. I'm <laughs> But, Does she have uh, to give you lessons on like how to take she's a like, selfie? I need a lot of lessons. I need help. I'm living in another century. <laughs> You're like, I got to catch up. <laughs> Heck yeah. But it's so interesting with technology changing all the time. You never know what's going to happen. The thing that I'm on the most other than Instagram is Facebook. So mm -hmm. I'm only on Facebook to know when people's birthdays are. It's so funny. Well, well thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Yeah, oh my God. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to go take my kid trick-or-treating now. Awesome. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. All right. Cheers. Bye.